Hi everyone, so I'm Joseph, and today I want to talk about X-Men First Class. It's a movie that came out about 12 years ago now, give or take. It came out May 25th, 2011. And before we, talk, before we start talking about the actual movie itself, I just want to give a brief history that I have with the uh, X-Men franchise. So when I was young, I never really grew up reading comic books, comic books, and in fact, um, I don't think I ever did read a comic book until I was over 18. But I did grow up watching, of course, the Spider-Man animated series in the 90s, the X-Men animated series also in the 90s, and other comic book shows such as the Batman animated series, Justice League, and Batman Beyond. Um, also, when it, came, when it comes to the MCU, I've never really been... Uh, I do enjoy the movies, but I never actively sought out to, seek it in, uh, to watch it in theaters unless I was invited out. Um, or unless my friends wanted to go watch it. So in other words, I uh, I never made plans to go watch it directly either because it was my idea or because I want to go watch it. With that being said, um, again, I do enjoy the Marvel movies either, be it from the MCU or non-MCU. Uh, so from Disney slash quite literally the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, uh, but when X-Men First Class came out, the only reason why I ended up watching it, I did not watch it in theaters. Uh, despite watching the cartoon, I didn't really um, love X Men the way that other people did. Uh, but what made me watch it was what made me watch it was personal reasons. Unfortunately, I needed a movie to watch because I was occupied, um, and so the nearest red box they actually had X Men First Class, and I thought, hey, it's a movie that I'm kind of interested. Uh, why not check this out, rent this, and check it out? And uh, lo and behold, it was a movie that I actually I did enjoy. I don't uh, personally own the movie, um, but. For whatever reason, recently I just got the hankering to rewatch it. I have a feeling was probably because of uh, recently the new Nicolas Cage movie. Um, I don't know what it's called, but it's, I think it's an Amazon Prime movie with Nicholas Holt. I think subconsciously that's why I wanted to seek out X-Men First Class. I didn't realize Nicholas Holt was part of the movie until I was looking up doing light research for this video. And I saw that the cast included Nicholas Holt. I was like, oh, well, subconsciously, obviously, those Amazon Prime commercials, instead of making me want to watch... Uh, that Nicolas Cage movie, which it's not out yet, and I probably will watch it because I am a fan of Nicolas Cage, and maybe want to seek out um, other movies. But I'm glad that I did rewatch it because I forgot how fun it is. Uh, so the individuals who are within this movie is uh, James McAvoy as Professor X, Michael Fassbender as Eric or Magneto, uh, Kevin Bacon as Sebastian Shaw. Now I've already mentioned Nicholas Holt; he uh, plays Beast. Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique, and there's another cast of uh, characters. It's a pretty big cast. We have our quote-unquote order cast, specifically the main cast, which is Michael Fassbender's and Michael Voigt's character, Magneto and Charles Xavier. And then we have the quote-unquote younger cast, which uh, they don't really come into focus until halfway through the movie. Uh, once we get to the climax, once they sack, uh, so spoilers, so just be aware about that. But once um, Darwin, the character Darwin, gets um, uh, murdered or, or, or killed, um, that's when they start playing. The movie start starts putting more of a focus on them on the uh, on the side cast. Uh, I do think all the all the actors did a great job of portraying the characters. Um, my only complaint, my interesting small complaint, and I, I'm not an actor myself, so excuse me if I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but just the individual who played Emma Frost, uh, I have the name of characters right here, January Jones. I just feel like sometimes maybe they were a little bit, um, what's the word, stoic? I was going to say frozen, um, but I, I was going to make a slight joke because uh, I think Emma Frost, isn't she eventually going to become... An individual who utilizes frost or ice abilities. Or maybe I'm wrong about that because in the movie she seemed to have used um, abilities that allowed her to change the, the pigment of her skin, make it a different material. Uh, but again, maybe the movie changed that. Uh, it might be uh, those might be her powers, or it was changed for creative uh, for creative differences or for an adaption. But despite that, I still did enjoy the cast. I still did enjoy Emma Frost's character as well. Uh, it, they implied at the end that she will be returning for the sequel. I, I did watch the sequel. I can't recall she is in it. But she is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite mind if it's the same actress. Again, um, even though I did have a smart complaint, I don't think she did a poor job. Uh, she did a decent job of portraying Emma Frost's character. Maybe that was the directive. Maybe that was the go for that character. Uh, before I continue with the main cast, the one character I do want to discuss is the man in black suit. <laughs> so that's quite literally the name of this uh, character. He's portrayed by Oliver Platt. And um, the reason why I want to focus on this character really quickly is just because 
I do wish that I feel like the movie just glossed over him. He's an individual who, when he discovers about the X Men, when he hears a presentation from from uh, Charles Xavier about mutations, he makes a choice to seek them out and to start working with them because he understands um, the significance of what's going on. And even though he was on their side and he did defend them, they kind of portrayed him. Uh, he was a government individual, right? A G-man. Uh, so they had they had to set up the, the 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 team up, the buddy between the buddy working between Xavier and Magneto. But even when that propped up, I never really felt like there was an obstacle or uh, that the man in the black suit was a hindrance to uh, Xavier or to Magneto. He was always an ally, uh, despite being a G-man. Uh, unfortunately. Azazio, excuse me, I don't think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Azazio, portrayed by Jason Fleming, he has the ability to, to so I don't know if he's Nightcrawler, I do know that Nightcrawler is blue, I should probably look up the name to see that is Nightcrawler, again, I'm not the biggest comic book fan nor uh, X-Men fan, fan, so pardon me for my lack of knowledge, uh, but his ability is essentially, he's a red-skinned individual and his ability is to teleport, and um, there's a scene where he goes into the complex where the, the young uh, X-Men are located uh, currently during that time. Um, Xavier and Magneto are out of the complex, out of the compound. And um, Sebastian Shaw's character, um, oh, that is his character, sorry. <laughs> Kevin Bacon's character, Sebastian Shaw, he infiltrates the compound. And while doing so, it says, yo, is teleporting and grabbing all these government agents and taking them into the sky and just dropping them into the ground to their deaths, unfortunately. And that's what happened. That's the demise for the man in black. And it's just really glossed over. It's unfortunate after he dies, none of the characters really seem to acknowledge his passing away. Maybe there's deleted scenes and they do make a mention of that. But I do wish that that was included uh, just to really emphasize the idea of uh, humans working together with mutants. Um, but yeah, so now that we got that out of the way, we could talk about the main story as a whole. Uh, so I did grow up watching the original X-Men movies in theaters, but again... I don't own them and I didn't re I haven't really rewatched them. I think I've only seen them once or twice, uh, one time and a half, <laughs> once in theaters and again like during the uh, on TV or something like that or at a friend's house uh, in the background. Um, but this is essentially a prequel movie and that's what makes it such a, a fun watch. Even if one does not want to watch the original movies that came out, X-Men 1 and X-Men 2, uh, Wolverine Origins and The Wolverine, I believe it's called. There's no need to watch all of that. If one wants to... Uh, I'm sure it'll heighten the experience a little bit, but and there's only one cameo that 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 connects back to those other movies, and uh, so again, spoilers, but it does reference uh, uh, Wolverine's character by uh, portrayed by Hugh Jackman, and it's just a very small cameo. I know a lot of people really enjoyed it, but honestly, for me, it just seemed a little bit uh, too on the nose, just because during that it was a montage scene of Xavier and Magneto going out to recruit different mutants for the new team uh, that the Man in Black is setting up, and. Um, uh, Wolverine just says to F off or something like that. They introduce them, they being Magneto and Xavier, they, they introduce themselves and Wolverine just says to F off and they just take off. While it's with everyone else though, they make the effort and the chance to actually converse and speak with them. And it, it was just too fast, too quick. And I don't know why that they did that. The movie is fairly long. It's about two hours. And um, I don't think they could spend too much time on the cameo. But I just felt like it wasn't as organic as it could have been. But I am aware that a lot of people did enjoy it. Um... Uh, yeah, so uh, one does not need to watch the previous movies. Uh, James McAvoy and uh, Michael Fassbender, they're portraying in a, a version of Xavier and Magneto that's uh, their origin story, how uh, they came to know one another and how they just, uh, how they unfortunately ended up becoming enemies. I do like the, I do really appreciate um, the bromance that was within the movie as well. So for example, we'll focus on the obvious one later, Xavier and Magneto. But Darwin and Havoc, they seem to have really formulated a, um, a like a best friend relationship. And it was unfortunate after Darwin had passed away, he gets killed by Sebastian Shaw's character. So Sebastian Shaw, I'm not gonna lie, his power kind of confuses me. I thought he just absorbed energy, but at the end he seemed to have been invincible. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But his power is to absorb energy and to transfer that to different people or through his body movements. And um, he destroys or kills um, Darwin by getting some of his energy and putting it into his mouth, forcing him to eat it. And you really felt the, um, I felt bad for Havoc and um, losing what seemed to be his friend. But fortunately, just like with the Men in Black, they don't really focus on that loss. Um, that loss does act as the catalyst for the rest of the group to go, no, we're not going to go back to our regular lives. I know you want us to go back, you being Magneto and Xavier, but we want to get... Re not revenge, but we want to get justice 
for Darwin, and that's when Magneto comes out and says, well, what about vengeance? Will vengeance be okay with you? And they start working together as a team. That's the point, I think, well, where we start seeing um, the differences between Magneto and Xavier. Um, I think Xavier, if he had a choice, he would, would have preferred to have sent the young individuals home because of the fact that they're young and he cares about them. But with that being said, I do think that Magneto has a point as well. Um, that they want to get vengeance for their friend. Maybe vengeance isn't the correct, uh, uh, isn't the correct mindset to have for your friend. Uh, maybe justice, um, or just, um, well, yeah, just justice in general will be the better mindset. But we know that they're doing this. They mean the director, the writer, they're doing this on purpose to further establish how Magneto and Xavier are going to start butting heads, and. Um, and yes, so as the movie continues, the whole premise is that Sebastian Shaw's character is trying to start a nuclear war because he wants to uh, uh, up uh, what's the word? Not hijack, but ups mm, jumpstart. There we go. He wants to jumpstart the mutant uh, revolution, uh, destroying and killing all humans and allowing mutants to rule the world. Uh, so just I think there is a small plot hole in that, and just that um, even if mutants are different and are adaptable to different environments compared to Homo sapiens. I mean, it's going to be a nuclear wasteland. I still think a lot of mutants are going to end up dying because they won't be able to survive in that kind of environment. Um, but that's never here or there, right? Maybe Sebastian Shaw was just being too emotional with what he was attempting to achieve and not thinking about the logistics about that, right? And what's pretty cool is that we also see the, the origin story of Magneto's helmet. It was made because of Charles Xavier to help block, uh, to help protect uh, Sebastian Shaw's mind. Uh, to not let it be infiltrated because obviously Charles Xavier's power is to, he's a telepath, so he's able to go into um, people's minds and discover personal thoughts or make them do things they may not want to do. And by the end of the movie, uh, Magneto gets that helmet, and by the time he puts it on, we realize that these differences that he has with Xavier, unfortunately, not, they're not going to be able to discuss it. And where do these differences stem from? It's coming from his personal history, his being Magneto. So the beginning of the movie begins with, um, unfortunately, World War II and the Holocaust and with the young Magneto being separated from his mother. And Sebastian Shaw's character is a scientist. And when he discovers that Magneto has powers, he's trying to encourage him to utilize it. And of course, he does so in the, one of the more uh, inhumane ways by using his mom um, as, a, as a stick. Um, the carrot being that uh, if he uses his powers, she'll live. The stick being that if he can't use his powers, she'll die. And unfortunately, young Magneto isn't able to um, channel his powers. And Shaw ends up shooting Magneto's mother. And so that ends up being the basis of Magneto's character. From that point forward, he just wants to kill Sebastian because he took away that relationship that Magneto had with his mother. It is pretty sad, especially as an individual who grew up um, with a single mom, uh, single parent household. <laughs> uh, it was pretty sad, um, and I could understand Magneto's point of view, but obviously I do stand by with Xavier. I think what would have been best for Magneto was to have captured Shaw and to allow him to go into justice, but that's really difficult because at the end of the movie demonstrates, despite the mutant, despite Xavier's team helping the not just the American government, but also the Russian government because they're helping to prevent nuclear welf welfare, um, the humans, homo sapiens, they still make the choice to go against the mutants and they try to annihilate them. So it's a very nuanced situation. It's not black and white. And uh, I think the movie does a pretty good job of, um, of, of, of presenting a story with nuance while also still making it fun. Now, with that being said, there's still some elements. I do want to discuss some negative elements and more, more singular than, than plural. We'll already discuss some of them, like the, like the plot hole. Um, but one element that I do have to agree, uh, well, Dutch, who am I, who am I agreeing with? <laughs> one element that I have to agree with today's societal point of view, uh, stemming from uh, the Me Too movement and sexualization of movies, I do think it wasn't really necessary for Moria's character. So Moria is a CIA agent who ends up um, connecting with Professor Xavier because she witnesses as it, as it Azio, excuse me, Ezio, um, teleporting a government official while um, working with Sebastian Shaw. And she, in order to get into this meeting, uh, she infiltrates the meeting by essentially blending in with the strippers who are working at the, uh, it's, it's in Las Vegas or at that casino. And she doesn't have any lingerie or stripper uh, gear <laughs> to put on. So all she does is just take off her shirt. Just, she's just in her bra. She's supposed to be a CIA agent, but she's wearing a garter. Um, and she walks in, right? I mean, that part was really ridiculous. There was also another part that was a little bit sexualized, but um, I think that part made more sense. It had more nuance. I'm talking about the scene between Mystique 
and um, Magneto. That's actually where that meme came from, right? Um, I want to see the real you. I said the real you, uh, perfection. Uh, I think that scene, there's, there's a lot to discuss about that. And obviously, they're discussing about being comfortable in one's own skin. And even though there's an element of sexualization, the focal point is not that, that sexualization. The focal point is the subject matter that's being discussed. Um, compare that to, again, the beginning of the movie where one is just taking off the shirt. And I know she's doing so to infiltrate uh, a, a mob, uh, not a mob boss, I'm sorry, because they discussed mob bosses, but they're doing that to infiltrate um, a setting. Um, but it just wasn't, it was tactless in my opinion. If, if anyone ever wants an example of sexualization that's done with the purpose of making it um, to emphasize the seriousness of the situation rather than focusing on the sexual nature uh, of, the, of, the, of the scene itself, uh, I would highly recommend the scene from Deadwood. So uh, uh, spoilers for Deadwood. Uh, Trixie, she's a prostitute who works for Al Sorogen's, um The Gym, a saloon. Uh, towards the end of the show, the original series, uh, after, oh my goodness, what's his name? After Hearst, after Hearst, after he ends up killing a beloved uh, uh, Deadwood community member, Trixie makes the choice to go attack Hearst, to actually try to kill him. And she does so. She knows she can't just go inside because he has bodyguards. So what does she do? She actually unbuttons her shirt and <laughs> the bodyguards are like, oh. <laughs> she's able to walk in and she takes off her little pistol from um, her stocking and she shoots her right that was an amazing scene and from my do recall I believe they did show the uh, the scene and in, in, um, completely so it was in the nude uh, but if one was not watching that scene for the, for the for the breasts they were watching it for the action that Trixie was doing and they were cheering her on because the community the, uh, uh, who was the character it wasn't Charlie Utter, um, oh my goodness, it was a character, um, Alma, uh, Alma's husband from Supernatural. I'm just getting chills thinking about that scene because it was crazy when he walks in. Anywho, so sorry, but that's a really good example of sexualization done in such a way to uh, add agency to a female character. I don't think this was, I don't think it was done uh, very organically or well uh, in this movie, unfortunately. Um, but this is an older movie that came out 10, 12 years ago, right? So I think, I'm not trying to excuse it, but uh, um, it's just the fact that one, it is a little bit uncomfortable, but it doesn't take away anything from the movie um, generally as a whole. Excuse me, I'm just looking at my notes. Uh, oh, and as, I was, as always, I cannot read my own writing. So, oh yeah, so I already talked about the bro ship and, oh, sexuality. I thought it said senior, it looks like seniority. I'm like, seniority, I don't think that's a word. <laughs> Trying to figure out what this word says, but it's sexuality. Uh, so going back to, sorry, uh, excuse me, I already discussed Darwin and Havoc. Another element of the bromance that I really enjoyed was between Magneto and Xavier. It was quite, uh, I think the tragedy could have been emphasized a little bit better, but I do think that as the audience viewer, we do get, sorry guys, I, I just see my hair up here, so let me just, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so again, I do think uh, the movie could have done a better job of just emphasizing the loss of that friendship that Magneto had with Xavier. And um, although we do see at the end how they end up splitting up, we don't really get the emotional consequences from that. And uh, the movie quite literally ends with Magneto breaking Emma Frost out of prison. And, and that's just how it ends. And uh, I would have liked to have preferred maybe a, sol a solitary scene, kind of like going back to Star Wars Episode Three when Anakin starts having those emotional traumatic feelings about what he should do in regards to Palpatine. He's sitting, I believe it's the Jedi concert room, he's sitting there contemplating, and Wallace Padme, she's actually, sorry, my hair is so cool. <laughs> Wallace Padme, she's at her apartment looking out, and they're both just, well, thinking, they're self-reflecting. I think it would have been kind of cool to have a scene, something similar to that, after they say their goodbyes to the new group, they just, well, contemplate, and they're just, maybe Magneto puts his, hand behind, puts his hands behind his back and just stares out a window, or... Xavier, because he just got paralyzed, he's sitting down looking at paperwork or looking at uh, documentation, which just occurred. Uh, but just to really emphasize that loss of friendship, I think that would have really heightened the movie. Um, so, just double checking my notes, I do believe that's everything I do want to discuss. Would I recommend X Men First Class? Yes, I would highly recommend it. Even if one is not an X Men fan, even if one is just a general X Men fan, uh, it, it's a fun, enjoyable film. It is a little bit longer than it needs to be, in my opinion, but despite that, by the end of the film, uh, one does not feel like they wasted their time. Um, and also, I would argue, knowing that there is a sequel, they might be more interested in checking out the sequel. Uh, for people who are huge X-Men fans, you might have a different perspective. 
Uh, I do kind of regret not doing more research into looking into the characters and seeing if they were portrayed uh, like the comic book counterparts. Uh, so uh, I can't discuss that perspective, the comic book fan perspective, but just as a general audience uh, member, just as a general fan, I do highly recommend the film. And if you have seen it, let me know what you think about it. And have a great day and take care. Thanks for watching. I do appreciate it.